So hey, what's up everyone? You're currently tuned into TBD on the live stream or here on KCSBFM 91.9 in Santa Barbara and netnetradio.com out of Tijuana. I'm joined by my friend Maddie and uh, we're joined by Jonathan from his project called Glia from their home in Fairfax, Virginia. So uh, how have you been holding up in the quarantine, Jonathan? Like what have you been up to? How have you adapted? How do you like virtual gigs? The world has been pretty chaotic the past couple months, especially for those living in the U.S. Yeah, um, I think it, it's been an adjustment like for anybody else. But um, yeah, I would say the biggest change is just like 
could nobody could have ever predicted this would happen. Yeah. <laughs> and even though I have a pretty close knit family, everybody is within like a couple miles driving distance. Mm-hmm. But it's like with the lockdown and the quarantine, you still kind of feel isolated. You're trying to be cautious. So yeah, I think that's been the biggest adjustment is just only being with myself, my family. Yeah. <laughs> and the past year has been kind of wild because. Um, me and my wife had our first kid, so mm. congratulations! Uh, thank you. And sometimes now <laughs> I kind of struggle to figure out what in this weird situation is due to being a first-time parent, and what is like this catastrophic quarantine yeah. pandemic <laughs> lockdown. Yeah. All in all, we've been doing well though, so I can't no complaints here. That's cool, dude. Uh, I'm glad that you you came out like relatively unscathed, I guess, exactly. for the, the most part. Um, exactly. You know what's actually wild too is you asked about um, gigs. Um, I might be in the unusual position that I wasn't really performing before mm. the pandemic, so that's been a whole other weirdness of like starting to step into. Um, making music more when there's like no way to do a live show yeah exactly that's really interesting actually so you're kind of uh you know dipping your feet in when it's been totally virtual so was there a reason that you never performed live like uh pre-pandemic pre-covid i think it was just like in normal artistic insecurity and Mm. i'm a hermit kind of like i like being around people but i don't know I think I always talk myself out of it or, or thought there's other people better or there's someone else who would be like more interesting to perform. Yeah. And uh, just got my arm twisted by, I don't know if you know Andrew Scheich in out of Chicago area. He's, okay. um, he was running a performance space out there uh, uh, called an open space. Mm. And um, just because of where we both lived, uh-huh. he liked my music, but, I had never gotten a chance to go out to Chicago and perform there. Yeah. When it, when it got to be virtual, he was like, you have to, yeah, you have to just, you have to do it. You have no excuse anymore. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's kind of what got the ball rolling. That's cool. So, uh, do you expect yourself to, uh, perform like in person when it's a thing again? Most likely. Yeah. I probably still won't perform as much as other people, but, um, there's a decent, um, spot out in this area um called rhizome that used to be like right on the outskirts of dc we had a uh, we had luke stewart on the show if you're familiar okay and, yeah. yeah and luke so stewart was talking probably, about rhizome yeah that's what i was gonna say it's like a it's an awesome space that i don't think there really was anything like that even when i was younger yeah that's a super it's a like a hub for the community for experimental mm-hmm. almost anything they have like they'll do like film events DIY workshops for building things and then performances with all types of music. So it's really cool. That's awesome. Cool. Well, hopefully, you know, if you uh, get, I guess, into the mood for touring, we can see you out in California. But if not, maybe one of these days we'll make it out to the East Coast and we could see you before it rise over or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, I guess that was kind of just like uh, something I was going to, I was uh, just curious about because. Just by looking at your discography, uh, you've like created a pretty accomplished catalog of work with like, you know, labels all over the place, such as Finery, Leaving, Dasa from yep. Greece. Um, but you also yep. have like a ton of stuff under just like, you know, self release. Yeah, and uh, you know, your earliest record even came out. What I think I saw on your Bandcamp, it was called like Smithereens, and that was from like 2010. And it's yeah, yeah it's like really interesting to hear that. Uh, you know, you just haven't really performed, but you've been at it for so long. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, actually, no. Go ahead. I want to. I kind of want to hear the, the thought or question. That's a good point, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, it was just like interesting to me to hear you say, like, "Yeah, I haven't really been performing stuff," and I'm like, "Oh, you'd think that someone would bug you if you've been at it since 2010 to play a show with them or something," <laughs> you know? Especially with so many people hitting you up for tapes from like literally like all over the world. It seems like you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's kind of the positive and negative of being in Virginia. Um, it's pretty close to... So what's weird about even the part of Virginia I'm in, I don't know how familiar you are with the state, but like Richmond, which is a few hours south, yeah, 
has an incredible scene, especially for instrumental music, for beats, for like, I don't know why there's this gap between like Richmond Mm -hmm. and Baltimore, where even DC doesn't have as much going on as those two spots to me. Um, But yeah, I think it was just a matter of, I was too lazy to drive up to New York <laughs> to force my way into so like I had some friends in that area yeah who who put on events um and that was kind of like a even a big part of my development as an artist was some time I spent around Hudson New York mm. that scene is just, like there's a folk and like chamber classical Ooh. scene oh the with spookfish Spook, Spookfish doesn't ring a bell, but there's tons of like there's literally tons of artists and performance spaces there. Yeah. Like, for some reason, just a couple, um, a couple hours out of outside New York City itself, further up the Hudson River, then there's a ton, there's just it's beautiful. Like I think a lot of it has to do with the college out near New Paltz and some mm-hmm. other spots. But um, yeah, I think it was just a matter of I'm kind of. It didn't seem as weird to me because Mm -hmm. so many of the artists I grew up loving were kind of overlooked. Yeah. So I think when I started making music, and this isn't a any kind of like judgment on people who have higher aspirations, but I just never thought it would turn into anything. I figured there's so many people over decades or just around the world because i'm really into music from other countries too Mm -hmm. who they put in the work they made beautiful stuff or they made stuff that was really personal and compelling Mm -hmm. and just because of circumstances then you know they kind of of had to wait for their opportunity yeah if that opportunity ever came i feel like i still see this attitude um that you have like even when you like post stuff like nowadays like i think you posted something about your record and it was like weeks later or something after it came out and this was in like december i think and you're just like (laughs) yeah i didn't want to like flood it there's like so many other artists putting stuff out in december but here's my record if you want to check it out you know i feel (laughs) (laughs) i feel like that attitude is like still reflected which i think is pretty cool yeah yeah that it is what it is. Actually, it's you know, another part of the the equation might also just be, um, I'm the youngest of four kids. Yeah. Wow. And uh, it's really tough to impress my family. <laughs> <laughs> so, especially like music. like When you're making some bleeps and bloops that the average person exactly, probably can't get exactly, into. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? They don't, <laughs> they don't really get it, maybe still. So. Yeah. Maybe that kind of always made me think of myself as like, eh. It is what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel you. I feel you on the parents not really uh, understanding the music, though. I, I, uh, <laughs> I'm also really into like emo music and stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. And I was like telling my dad that I just had hit up this artist called Basura Asiala from Colombia. They're the screamo artist. My dad's like screamo, and I'm just like, <laughs> <What> yeah, <is laughs> that? yeah. I'm like, I'm just not gonna get into it. They're a cool band. <laughs> <laughs> international yeah they're from colombia not to explain (laughs) exactly i was like yeah they're just this really cool band like (laughs) but anyway so uh, i was gonna ask you too like uh what were your beginnings as a musician and like what were some like formative like computer music moments and and inspirations like how did you get started you said that you were into like i guess this like chamber like indie rock movement in like new york and stuff so yeah so uh, that kind of happened kind of it pretty interestingly. But well, I guess first the roots of how I kind of got into making music. As I mentioned, my family likes music, but um, especially my parents are more into like anything you could dance to. They're from a uh, West African country, Nigeria. Mm, that's cool. And um, there's a huge, beautiful music tradition from there of a variety of styles, both in the past and now. Uh-huh. Um, but I kind of grew up with the older Nigerian music as one foundation. And then both my parents kind of have a common interest in 70s folk and like some of the rock that came out back then. Yeah. And, and reggae music. Um, so I had that as an, a kind of another foundation. And my mom really likes like vocal jazz some of the older artists from the 20th century, all the famous names you could think of, uh-huh. Ella Fitzgerald, yeah. you know, Louis Armstrong, Frank Sinatra, Nat King Cole. So I kind of had that 
also in the back burner. Then growing up in the 90s, my siblings were into everything. So <laughs> alternative rock, hip hop, R&B, anything like that kind of caught our attention. And I started learning drums. So that was the first like thing mm. that got me into music was I wanted to like be the drummer for Weezer or something. Yeah. So. <laughs> we all do. We all do. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's really <laughs> so it, it kind of, that was kind of um, the beginnings. And like simultaneously as I was learning drums, I decided I wanted to like get into making beats, making hip hop. Mm. I saw music videos and I was like, okay, I keep seeing like NPCs or different stuff like that. Thought I might try and get one. And I looked online to try and figure out how much it costs. And I was like, okay, this isn't happening. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. I got to figure out another way. And maybe that was um, really what led me into computer music is reading online, finding out people could make beats with just a DAW on your computer. Yeah. And um, so I just started tinkering. And it was just little by little making crappy stuff putting it online, having people critique it, and then starting to figure out myself by comparing what I was able to make mm -hmm. and like my favorite songs at the time or favorite producers. Um, so it, it was kind of, you know, a long winding road. I guess what led me most directly was um, one of the, my favorite artists in that New York scene that I was talking about. He played 12 string guitar. Okay. But he also made laptop music, like ambient music. And I had never really heard, I heard a lot of experimental music from the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. whether it was Terry Riley or artists like that who made stuff with analog synthesizers. And I was into Elian Radik, Delia Darbyshire, um, a lot of the BBC radiophonic artists. Oh, but that's great stuff. Yes. And like I, I just didn't think of trying to do some of the same sounds digitally until I met him. So mm -hmm. that was cool. And um, maybe around the same time, uh, I've always been into video games too. So that's on yeah. the other side of like how I got into computer music. Yeah. Um, Which ones in particular? Any soundtracks that stand out? To like video game soundtracks? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know. I was a big fan of Nintendo and Zelda and like, oh, uh, the and yeah. like uh, Sega. So Zelda games, all of the, um, I want to say like all of the Metroid games. Oh, those are um, Yeah, so classics. <laughs> yeah. And we, we would also play a lot of like fighting games. So for whatever reason, you know, any fighting game you can think of on a Sega or Nintendo system in the 90s. Stuff like Power Stone and... Okay, exactly. Like <laughs> Virtua Fighter, oh my god. <laughs> and like Dreamcast too had a huge impact because like Trick Style, I don't know if you ever heard that. <laughs> it was like this... It was the, like a futuristic like hoverboarding game. <laughs> the Dreamcast game that sticks that to me with the best or most noteworthy soundtrack, it's Jet Set Radio. I was waiting if you would say that. Yeah, that definitely took the scale. That probably was the first time I was willing to admit that I liked electronic music. Like, <laughs> up until that point, it always seemed like a gimmick in my head because you know I, I grew up hearing it, but it was always like it reminded me more of the past than the future, or reminded me mm -hmm. of like the '80s more than anything. And like I love that soundtrack, I, and I. It had such a wide variety that, um, yeah, I think Jet Set Radio was a kind of a turning point to shift out of just drumming, yeah, and and like hip hop. So yeah. it's it's and, funny again that you mentioned that because I've got a song from Sibo Mato on my show. Yeah. They had they had birthday cake, and I never connected the dots between that song and Viva La Woman, which. I've been listening to it. I'm like, this is really one of the best things I've heard in ages. <laughs> and then I've also got a Bomberman 64 track on my show today because yeah. it's really <laughs> solid drum and bass. And there are wonderful YouTube comments of people being like, my mom made me just play this game because she wanted to hear the music. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Bomberman, um, there's like this Space Monkey game, I feel like I remember. Oh, yeah, Space Monkey like, Ball. There's like too many, but all of those kind of just like made me 
um also really fascinated with like dj culture and remixing yeah i did like reggae but then again i hadn't heard as much newer stuff that was happening until then and um kind of the way that it really connects to what i'm doing now is that uh the DS came out, and there were a bunch of music games on DS. Oh, yeah. And, like, rhythm games, too. Yeah. And then Electroplankton had a crazy, cool, like, digital synthesizer soundtrack that you could manipulate and play. And um, I remember looking up stuff about that, and I found the Tenorion, which was made by one of the developers. Mm. It was, like, a glowing toy cube slash instrument synthesizer if you've never seen it i'll send you a link like afterward it's crazy <laughs> yeah dude i'd be so, down to see that that sounds sick i was just curious about it kept reading about it and everywhere that i saw one of those um i saw comparisons to the um monom which had just come out oh really probably around like 2006 2007 okay and so, yeah, that really was what blew the doors off for me. Of I had never heard of Max MSP. Mm-hmm. I had never thought of open source, like co- using code to make sound mm-hmm. like that. All of the people in that um, who make those and use those from Daedalus, like probably the most famous example, to a lot of other independent artists around the world. Mm-hmm. That kind of really got me into using a computer instead of using something else yeah so uh in in the cached media discord i've seen that you guys talk (laughs) or there's like a gear a gear uh channel or whatever on there and i see you guys i have no idea what you guys are talking about by the way (laughs) um it's like way past me and it's interesting because my friend alex who uh alex meinhoff he's from kcsb we know Why him do I from know that name okay i was gonna ask you like, yeah he he chats in there um and he's from kcsb too so it's really interesting to just see like i joined i'm like oh dude alex what up dude <laughs> and he's always like doing diy music he makes really cool stuff we've had him play a couple shows with his project uh 20.83 microseconds but um he would, he would, uh, recording pot music. yeah it, okay. it to be. yeah <laughs> nice, nice, nice. um but I was going to ask, too, because it seemed like you guys were talking about, like, making instruments. Do you, like, make instruments yeah. as well? Uh, the long story short is no. <laughs> <laughs> but it, that's, like, even more embarrassing than the whole fact that I wasn't performing because there's no reason that I shouldn't be have made my own instruments. But, okay, so I'm going to talk about this because this is actually a really cool topic. Um, part of my interest in using the computer still even though my like my default or where i feel most comfortable because what i kind of started out on was drums then using a turntable and mixer like kind of the scratch music scene yeah in the bay area and in la um in the early 2000s really inspired me and chicago the chicago had some of the best producers but that's another (laughs) time but like those I started with literally just one turntable, one mixer, and a loop pedal. So like using a delay, using a sampler to make and modify loops is kind of how I approach anything else, whether Mm -hmm. it's just a a computer program or any other new instrument. And um, so I've always kind of felt most comfortable misusing other people's instruments that uh-huh. were already there, or misusing <laughs> tools, misappropriation. Yeah. And so the challenge then is I got excited when I saw people using code to make their own instruments. Yeah. But I'm just, my mind doesn't work that way. Like, I, it's easy enough, it's doable, whether it's Max, any other free program, pure data, stuff like that. There's a million different things you could try and use that are free. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know. There's just kind of a hurdle mentally for me. Like I, ha- I come up with ideas, but then to go from idea to execution, I usually talk myself out of it and start making music again. <laughs> <Instead of working laughs> in the yeah. So uh, this is really interesting to me because I just don't really know much about this. So when you say make an yeah. instrument, do you mean make like a physical thing? Because I saw you guys talking about soldering or is making an instrument okay. literally like coding? Like, well, to, th- that's also a great question. Well, it could really be either because um, I think it's easier than ever now 
to, if you want to make a physical instrument, to actually, like, there's websites where you could design the circuitry. You can oh, really? get, get it printed out for cheap, buy the part separately, mm-hmm. and then solder it together yourself, put it together yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that, it reminds me like, of a project. Hey, yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, bad, there's a guy named Bad Jazz, that's the name of the band, and they've done some stuff on Timble Tapes and a couple other labels. And it's, I think, two people, and they're making their own instruments and then making jazz music with that. And that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. It's amazing. It's, but like, I'd say the two things that kind of open my eyes to that, if you're going to make a physical instrument, um, were um, there was a new, I feel like he's a New York area artist, Tristan Parrish. I'm probably mispronouncing his name. He did this like one bit symphony project like 10, 15 years ago, mm-hmm. where he literally composed um, a full scale, like 45 minute piece and then programmed um, one circuit to play that piece as like a digital piece of art, like a physical piece of art. You could buy it and you turned it on and you weren't playing like a physical recording, you were playing the composition from his circuitry or whatever, Um, which is just wild. And at the time I had never seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I would say the the other person, kind of stands out just was on the tip of my my tongue and now i'm forgetting but like there's <laughs> plenty of people now who um oh actually now i remember um young marble giants have you oh, heard of this group? yeah oh, yeah oh okay yeah I, I need so, to go run and get my my reissue okay, on. Yeah. okay so like if you read the liner notes for their album at the time like I'm reading the liner notes, and it was like they made they basically made a small analog synth for the drums on that whole album. Oh and wow, that's like, insane! What? Like who makes their own synth? It's one of my favorite <laughs> post punk albums because it's it's a very like this is indie pop. Anyone could do this, and it has this very strange like I'm in a box sound. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, and I mean also there's other things. This is me being a nerd. I think they use like a baritone guitar through most of it (laughs) but like the melodies and the drums was a homemade synth so again yeah that's just like one side of things but yeah um the other side of it is now with uh people have made it really easy with um raspberry pi teensy Mm. there's a lot of like chip micro computer things that are super cheap like you could buy one of those for 20 or 30 dollars i think no totally yeah and then you kind of just piece together the accessories you might want. Mm-hmm. And you can program any kind of code you want on there. And they're like fully capable t- little small computers. So it's like the same way you can make music with a laptop. If you put in the effort with one of those, you can um, you can kind of have your own instrument. And to cut to the real chase several companies have kind of or artists have made like little kits or made even a code base that makes doing something like that easier so Mm -hmm. you've probably heard people chatting about organelle critter and guitari organelle yeah um mono norns Mm -hmm. those are all just like little ways to make the audio side of the code easier for people who aren't super nerds <laughs> oh really so like uh yeah. like the monome norms so are you still like kind of coding but they just make it like simpler i guess is what you're trying yes. to say so you still yeah. have to so like they write do code. a lot of the like behind the scenes math for the things that you would want in a synthesis in a in a um either a synth or a sampler so yeah that's basically it this makes it a little bit easier so it's still not Maybe someone off the street who's never tried it would still maybe be a little intimidated by it, but there's like tutorials and stuff like that if you want to learn. So yeah, that's sick. So um, what's the concept behind your concentric series? Uh, you had since we're like on the topic, I guess, of like you know writing programs and like instruments and stuff. You had Dan yep. Dirks write your liner notes on Concentric Six. I don't really know yeah. who that is, but just like <laughs> looking into it, I saw that he wrote like a program that I've seen other people mention in their music. Yeah. Or like, what well, I forget what he called it. I'd have to look yeah, at, look at it. It's cheat codes. Yeah. He's cheat codes. Cheat yeah. Codes is, this is his most famous and like the most fleshed out instrument. Um, yeah. Dan is, it's impossible to speak in 
maybe a couple sentences about Dan. He's super cool. Been um, like a huge resource and super open and friendly for years now Mm -hmm. in just talking about music, coming up with ideas. Sometimes I've beta tested music um, apps that he's written. And yeah, I'm going to sell it him short, but like (laughs) he's the most super friendly, open guy about just um, sharing information about um, making music, especially with stuff like this. So Mm -hmm. what ended up happening with those liner notes and then the whole Concentrics project, uh, Concentrics kind of for me was a way to let go of overthinking music yeah and um i guess also when i first started talking about it well okay so this is like i guess maybe end of 2019 i started sharing uh the concept behind it before i even shared some of the recordings Mm -hmm. um and it was and something of interest to me for years where whether it was in poetry that i wrote or music that I made, I kind of had some of the same principles of what's the least amount of input I can give to make something that I enjoy. Uh And it kind of related to relinquishing agency and the idea that I'm in full control of the music making process or the art making process and was more about um, like the idea of maybe you throw a pebble into a lake and you just watch the ripples. Mm. You watch the concentric circles kind of expand away from your source of input. Uh Um, And it also kind of was a way to organize my aesthetic ideas. And so I prefer electronic music that's less focused on complexity and melody and more focused on complexity and rhythm Mm-hmm. and texture and timbre so it gave me also a chance to kind of i guess shift the listener's focus toward what i wanted them to hear mm-hmm. in a track and so I, I i felt like the only way to really explain it was not just to talk about it but to make examples mm-hmm. and that i would learn as much about it as listeners would so i just started making a bunch of tracks and eventually I released a few collections and like people started getting more in, in, in interested in it. Dan was one of them. Yeah. So by the time I did that volume, the sixth one, then I felt like it would be appropriate for him to uh Read the <laughs> to line, do the liners. It. Yeah. Because he had a perspective of having seen my my past work in comparison to that as well. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so another thing that you know, I've noticed about your music. So you released a couple, a couple uh, sample packs for other people mm. to use in their music. Yeah. Uh, your most recent being, you know, Follow Deck. Um, yeah. I've had another musician uh, named Meral. Her name is Meral. Um, mm. She's just released oh, her I most recent music. Yeah, she's really cool um, <laughs> on the show. And you know, a big thing that we talked about when I interviewed her is like her approach to sampling as an instrument, um, specifically. Yeah. So, so what's your take, like? What's your take on sampling as an instrument and how do you incorporate sampling into your music and how do you approach it? That's a really good question. Um, I think I would agree with Moral. Um, and yeah, so for me, sampling is like the basis of everything that I do. Uh-huh. Even something that sounds like a polished song or polished, as polished as my music gets. <laughs> It's probably been through so many phases. Um, in that sense, I kind of think of sampling more like printmaking than most uh-huh. other people do. Uh-huh. Printmaking is something I'm kind of interested in as well. It's just like any kind of... The way that an image could be transferred and modified with print is really unique. And I feel like something I also have learned from Moral is... Fidelity, or the ideas that we often have about fidelity and quality of music Mm -hmm. nowadays, now that it's really possible to get things super pristine, I feel like maybe too many people are shooting for the same thing. And this isn't saying go to the other extreme, where then now there's this huge, like, everything is lo-fi. 
Yeah. <laughs> which is cool. Oh boy. Like, but like, I feel like there's so much space in between both of those extremes to really make some, that's one way to make music personal. Uh-huh. So that's kind of how I view sampling. So whether it's my way of warping someone else's music or my way of taking an old recording of myself and developing it in a way that I wouldn't have been able to play physically. Uh-huh. That's kind of how I look at it. And so like the sample packs I've done, uh, I got to give a shout out to Roger Halbon, 10-4 Raj and <laughs> Dan and some of the other people who kind of asked me for a sample pack because I would have never made one myself because I feel like the way I sample is very like unorthodox yeah. and undesirable. So uh-huh. like I never organize my samples. I never have my samples organized by BPM, by tuning, by <laughs> uh, the duration. I never know how long a sample is. <laughs> I'm not trying to have it loopable on like a perfect set of number of bars. Mm-hmm. I kind of just it's it's a free for all. If I take something, I use it. If I don't use it fit in a in a finished track that day and I messed with it, I'll mm-hmm. save it. And then I might use it later, but I don't like organize it. I probably have like seven versions of the same sample because it's stuff I worked on different days and left it cast aside or saved it at a, at a different tempo. And yeah, so it's basically like those sample packs. The only way I could make myself make one was I decided, okay, if people want it, mm-hmm. I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> and I'm going to let them know in advance, this is not your normal sample pack. Yeah. So I expect you to do what I do with it. So I kind of gave them random names and was just like, if you download it, rename it, Or listen to it. If there's any you don't like, toss them. Yeah. Keep the ones you want, rename them whatever you want, and organize it how you choose to. So Yeah. The release is also one of the the few of a lot of your releases um have the some rights reserved copyright protections. Really Really unique stuff there again, just like Creative Commons. And I know you had talked a bit about remix culture earlier Mm -hmm. here. And again, I think kind of seeing the legacy of that or seeing that in your band camp is really fascinating continuation well thank you yeah um here's let me just say this i don't think um (laughs) if there really was a way and maybe this is an ideal that other people have expressed but like i would not have any rights associated to my music i don't want any music whether i let it be known if you hear this any music i've ever made feel free to sample it i'm never gonna come after you it's all royalty free yeah. I just can't always label it that way <laughs> on Bandcamp or uh-huh. anywhere else I might showcase it because I don't think anyone owns sound. Mm-hmm. And yes, of course, I'm going to abide by laws. But hey, for, for my music, you know, I'm not in, interested in that. It's, it's vibration. Like, how could someone <laughs> say that they're going to police what someone else does with it? If you want to do make an, a crappy song with something you sample from me, do it. Yeah, But what's more likely is you're going to make something better than me. So I feel like <laughs> when there's no limits on sound like that and people do feel free, the results end up being so transformative. Yeah, it, it is a way of like community building because when people have told me they've remixed something I made or used now, like just in the few months that I've shared these sample packs, a few people have shown what they've done with them and it's like, I would have never done that. Yeah. And it's amazing. it's amazing. I might actually take some. I'm working on a terrible field recording. I'm like, let's see. This would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> you should. You really? should. Um, it's really, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned 10.4 Raj, right? Um, yes. Yeah. They just released a record. Uh, and Mark Merzer, I think, played on it as well. Mark Merzer did some yes. guitar work on yeah, it. The, uh, what um, is it? Oh, we love Mark. Fit, fit, fit. Yeah. Why am I forgetting all Figmore, I think it is, and yeah, Juicebox. Figmore. Yeah. New duo on Press Select. Yeah, that was literally like the chillest record I've heard in a while. Just like some, I don't even know, some R&B soul type stuff. I don't, it's just, yeah, it's it's honestly really sick, Maddie. You should listen to it. Um, so were your samples used in that record at all? No. <laughs> if they were, he didn't, he would have told me, I, I think. But yeah, no, not on that one. I think they had, had that finished before I even started my sample. Yeah. Things, but Raj is really cool. Um, and speaking of remixes, 
that also actually is kind of how I fell backwards into computer music was um, wanting to remix stuff Mm -hmm. and relating to him. Uh, he gave me permission to remix a track off of his album before this Figmore one. Yeah. Um, which was, why am I forgetting that? It's, um, starts with the T. He's going to laugh about this later, but <laughs> like I, I heard the album and kind of reached out to him and I was just like, look, if there's any of these I can remix, let me know. I would yeah. be more than happy to. And he, kind of was curious what i would do with one track and so that's on um um he after he heard it yeah he let me release the uh remix as a single which was also super gracious and generous of him really appreciated that it was a fun fun project fun thing to tackle that's sick um so another thing i was going to ask you you kind of already like mentioned this before but like what's the coolest thing you've seen come to fruition from your samples uh oof. Your sample I would packs, have I to say, um, and this is where I'm like forgetting every every artist's name. Logan, <laughs> um, Logan Kane, I think is his name. Yeah, super like awesome at everything, but especially I think guitar. He took the the samples to a place I literally could not even have foreseen or imagined. Like, yeah, made this high tempo rhythm and then was playing over top of it that's that's probably the the best i've heard with it so do you just not do you ever like not know some of the people like personally that just use your samples and then send them to you and you're just like wow this is insane like like, sometimes it's just you'll get tagged in a post or something or people have emailed me so yeah it's, it's really interesting that's really cool so I, I guess uh, knowing that you incorporate samples into your own music, like you're saying, um, and that you yeah. don't really care about royalties or anything, is this sort of a way to give back to the community or like sample decks? Yeah. Um, well, let me make sure I'm understanding your question correctly. So you mean like if I were to sample someone else or like you mean my pack? I mean, just because like you sample other people's stuff, okay. is this kind of like your way of like, okay, I use samples. Here's some samples that anybody else can use. Kind of just like keeping the circle going, I guess. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So let me say this. Mm. It's actually something I wouldn't have (laughs) expected. Good question. (laughs) I wouldn't have expected to talk about this. Um, So here's the thing. Basically, I talk out of two corners of my mouth. Because (laughs) I believe that sound should be freely accessible but yeah. i'm also painfully aware of the reality of i'm poor it was not poor <laughs> but like i'm not trying to pay like a million dollar lawsuit over sample infringement or yeah something. yeah yeah so i pretty much don't really sample other people <laughs> oh really <laughs> <laughs> i do it but it like now for the first time you know i cleared one sample it's a small s- smaller but less famous artists Mm -hmm. i just reached out to them directly Uh and made sure they were cool with me using and asked what they thought would be fair for using it in one song and they were like if you use it in one song this if you use it in two songs this whatever Mm -hmm. um but aside from that yeah i mean in a way maybe that's why i have such that kind of viewpoint about my own music i mean i genuinely do believe i don't care if someone uses it but um, maybe it's also to absolve some level of guilt because I'll sample stuff from YouTube or I'll sample stuff from Instagram or uh-huh. something like if I find this, uh, but it would have to be, I kind of have these weird, like a weird sense of honor or rules where I feel like if, if I'm able to reach out to someone, there's no reason for me not to contact them. But like if for whatever reason, because the artist has passed away or something else like that, that I feel those rules don't apply. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know. I, can, I think it depends on, on what I hear. What you, I'll tell you the honest truth about sampling, though, is the way other people sample also is they hear a song they like and they want to almost loop something from that uh-huh. and then build around that. I almost feel like I can't make a good song if the song is good. Yeah. Like if I like the sound, I feel like they did it well enough that I'm going to leave it alone. I want to listen all, to that's it. That's all you can do with it. Yeah. 
yeah, like, but if there's something that's kind of a little cheesy or a little <laughs> off, then it's like I could twist this into something funky. I don't know. Yeah, something different. It's <laughs> kind of how I look at it. This is this is really fascinating to me, just because. Also, like the logistics of doing this, you're doing this all on these computer programs and yep. they're open source. They're all being built by different people with, I think, different, you know, skill sets or goals. But the end result is going through a computer program. Yep. Still, I remember um, with Marcus Pop stuff for the Oval, he always kind of emphasized the fact that he's like, well, yeah, we're taking apart these CDs. We have these samples, but I'm just dragging and dropping files. I'm not really making music. I'm just, you know, taking all the samples I've got and uh, assembling them into something. Yep. yep. And I think he was, again, astutely aware of the fact that, like, all of the music we're going to be making are in this kind of, you know, century. If you're doing it digitally by those computers, they have that final say. And so not only do you maybe have those biases or you have these, you know, different limiting factors. Yeah. No, I think maybe something... This is really actually a great question, which hopefully... I don't know if you're expecting me to take this long on it, but like, <laughs> w maybe what's also influenced my viewpoint about sampling is that I started with drums. Because I, I'll tell you the truth. When I started drumming, being a young person and hearing cool drummers, you think, like, okay, one of my favorite drummers was just passed away, Tony Allen, uh, played with Fela, and uh, basically invented a genre. He invented Afrobeat. Oh wow! By the way that he played the drums, uh -huh. he mixed together high life music from Nigeria, jazz, funk, like James Brown style funk, uh -huh. and he literally came up with a new type of drum beat. So when you're or like, I really love uh, Neil Peart with uh, oh yes with Rush. Like these guys, these are people who you felt like could create a beat or create something that had never been heard before, and I think. At that point in my in trying to learn to play music, I really felt like that was a goal. Like the level of excellence or mastery would be to create a rhythm. And the more I learned about rhythm, the more I heard rhythms from around the world, the more I heard electronic music and sequences, I think I felt like that's not really possible. So that that wasn't the goal anymore. It wasn't to create something that had never been heard. It was just to create something personal, uh -huh. to create something honest. And maybe the only way to kind of back my way into what I, my original goal was, was to combine elements um, even with effects or with, with delays or with samplers in, a, in some way that wouldn't, Resent, wouldn't be the same as someone else. No uh -huh. one else would make the same choices as me. So, um, but yeah, I think maybe once I felt like rhythms are universal and don't belong to anyone, and so anyone can reuse them and use them again, that same thinking kind of transferred into how I approach sampling. That's cool. So, uh, I guess uh, another thing I was going to ask is like you—you you said that you're really into like printmaking and stuff. And uh, yeah. I've noticed that, like, you always have, like, a different artist to make stuff for your releases. Um, and you had also mentioned one artist. I can't think of their name off the top of my head, but they introduced okay. you to, like, zines and stuff like that. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, so I'll, I'll talk about uh, It's Nick Vinaglia. Vin Vinaglia? Vinaglia? He's uh, now New York-based. used to be in um, New Mexico. Uh -huh. And... Um, so this is kind of kind of coming full circle. At back in the day when I was more into scratch music, coincidentally enough, he was a fan of some of the same bands. Yeah. So I would I would like you early YouTube comments and stuff and other discussion rooms mm -hmm. and stuff on that on on that style is how I first came across him. And I was also really into graffiti back in the day. Uh-huh. And especially the style that came out of San Francisco. Did you paint um, graffiti by chance, or no? Another side it. of the being a hermit, a little <laughs> yeah. too timid to do some of the risky things I'm interested in. Um, I have some friends that uh, are really into tagging and stuff. Amazing. Yeah, they've it's gotten amazing. locked up a few times. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's wild. I honestly don't know if I recommend the lifestyle just that exactly. they're living. But um, the I can say. 
the graffiti to printmaking pipeline is real. That happened yes. to my yes. brother in Richmond, Virginia. Yes, yes. He we'll got see. a Rizziograph printer. He's doing stuff. He did something for, uh, oh, God, Feel It Out Records, the punk oh, label man. down there in Richmond. Oh, wow, that's, that's sick. Hey, so, okay, so Riso, we're going to get back to Riso. So here's what happened <laughs> to me. I actually tried making my own ink. Oh, wow. I just, oh. I just thought it was cool. Like, you could make ink at home. Again, that was one of those, like, light bulb moments mm-hmm. as a teenager. And seeing that and understanding the skill and then, um, wait, what were we talking about? Nick. Okay, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so basically, I had this interest in a lot of the styles coming out of the Bay Area and in graffiti. And a lot of the same people who were in the graffiti world in, in out West were also starting to like set up their own galleries basically Uh and like make prints, make zines. They were doing posters for shows for bands. Um, So he kind of got me interested in uh, a certain shop run by Kelly Lynn Jones at the time. It was little paper planes and that's a whole history that you could probably look up. (laughs) She's since closed the shop, but um, it just kind of opened my eyes to, you know, like, the validation or mm, the validity of DIY art, Uh which wasn't the same where I lived geographically. So like he, he, he really helped me out of just understanding stuff, not even understanding stuff. He wouldn't even think of that way. It was just exchanging ideas, telling me about bands. He liked telling me about artists he liked Uh and uh, showing he, I bought a few zines from him too, that he had made. He's a really good photographer as well. So, yeah, that kind of just made me think more about that. And then later on, I had my own separate interest in different types of printmaking and eventually got a Riso. That is the most wild thing, piece of, like, nerdy gear I've ever owned. (laughs) But it was just too big and cumbersome. When I was moving, I had to get rid of it. That's that's a bummer. Yeah. But I, I... And as far as the artist you mentioned, you asked about... Uh, Nick did one of my recent art um, covers for ZVK mm-hmm. the tape I did, um, and that's kind of an actually an, ext- an extension or outgrowth from the Concentrics project because mm. I always kind of felt like I wanted to do my own art. Yeah, I I always did my own covers, um, and it wasn't until I did the tape for Finery and then. Um, once I started doing the Concentrics covers, I saw the impact that it ha- that opening myself up had on my own work. And that was just from me making the covers, making the music, and talking about the process that I decided to um, open it up even more. And each, from the fifth one, Andrew Scheich did the cover for the fifth Concentrics project. Then I was just like, I want to have a different artist do it every time, so... Yeah, I was gonna ask. So, do you have a you have a different artist doing it every time? Um, I also noticed that you had uh, I, I'm probably gonna say their name wrong, Olivier Olivier Cuer or something. Um, I would probably say his name wrong too. Yeah, he did excellently well. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, talking about our friend Alex uh, Meinhoff from uh, Discord again, <laughs> uh, he actually recommended me Olivier's music, and yeah, I had played it yeah. on the show before. Um, so when I saw that, like you had it's super you know, underrated. Yeah, one hundred percent. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah, no, very, very much so. And like when I noticed that you had hit him up for like you know a a visual piece of art or like a physical piece of art for like your your tape or whatever or your album. Yeah, th- I just think the connections are crazy. I was just like, wow, dude. I feel like there's so much connections going on with Glia and all these other all these other artists that are just, I guess bubbling on the surface yeah you know what i'm saying um it really it really kind of goes deeper than that too and i won't take long but olivier makes um one of the apps that i use he makes one of my favorite loopers it's called compass okay and it's um it's basically just stereo 60 second looper Mm. that you have control over the direction pitch rate and all this other stuff so i had already been using it on some of the other previous concentric projects so it made perfect sense for me to when I saw his album covers, I was like, "Can you make me one?" And yeah, he he obliged. <laughs> That's so cool. sick. So I guess how do you decide on um, who did make your artwork? Like you choose a different you know piece of art for every or a different artist for every release. 
do you yeah. like choose someone who you feel like goes well with the work you're putting out or is it just like oh i've been into this person's work recently oh uh, it depends i think i kind of really Im- i like improvisation so it just depends how i'm feeling but like yeah. <laughs> and i've actually tried both ways i've tried um having them listen to an early version or a couple of the songs and make something uh which is what happened i did a um album i guess it was by now december or november with matt looks mm. in um michigan and he's a like wood carver painter oh wow and um i sent him two tracks we intended it for to be an av collab so i sent him two tracks he started working on the art he made a track with me and then after I saw the finished artwork, I made one or two more songs, and then we decided on what would, would be the final release. But, like, there's been some where I knew in advance I wanted um, a specific artist to work with me on the project, and they, if they were available or if we could agree on something, then it, it worked out. And sometimes it was like, yeah, I think it's just it just depends. But... Uh, reaching out directly to artists is always for me the best way. To, yeah. And it's usually just from a conversation about their work. Like I'm really just genuinely impressed or intrigued by how they made something or mm-hmm. how they arrange things or what tools they use. And then we end up working together sometimes. That's cool. So um, I guess that's going to be another thing that I was leading into already. Um, I guess we're going to kind of like switch into like more of your very like recent work and like specific, I guess. Cool, um, cool. cool. You released like 20 records, it seems, in like 2020. <laughs> I just think that's crazy, dude. That's like... I roll her. <laughs> yeah. That's literally like the definition of like prolific. You know what I'm saying? And there's like three within a couple months. Dude, there's like people that put music out like every like five or six years or something, you know? Yeah. Um, I guess yeah. like, um, you know, just because we were already talking about collaborating, um, yeah. your, your tape with Matthew David from December, what can you tell me about that? And like... You know, you collaborate with like multiple other people. Like another release that I really liked of yours that I found recently was like, you know, a jazz record from like a jazz label, and like it was your take yeah. on jazz. Um, yeah. I guess, what is your approach to like collaborating and like, yeah, I guess just tell me about that and like your record with Matthew David. I would you know, love to. I would love to. Thank you. That's a really good question as well. Um, okay, so the way I look at releasing music so i've I've already kind of touched on the fact that i'm like an album centric artist (laughs) so (laughs) the the way that i kind of looked at music first of all as far as like labels or collaborating is i'm thinking of it however this works out in my mind like preparing for a gallery show Uh um so there's the way i make mute i Someone was just actually talking to me about this because I, I think it's a challenge a lot of independent artists face where they're like, they want to release music with a label. Yeah. They're trying to figure out how to get the label's attention mm-hmm. and, you know, it, should they have all the tracks done? Should they be demos? Are they going to have to revise stuff or compose new things after mm-hmm. they like initiate a relationship with the label? Um, I've been really fortunate. Like, not everything I've wanted has worked out. Um, there's still labels I would love to work with it. It just never has happened. Mm -hmm. But I kind of have been embracing, I've been really fortunate to kind of start out with the first label I kind of worked with was Finery because it, Mm -hmm. it was um, through Carl Fusick, an art, uh, a Canada based artist. I think he's in Vancouver now. Um, I heard his album it was a newer label at the time back in like 2014. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, Hey, how did, how did you get on this label? Next thing you know, I'm talking with um, the label head in Denmark. And essentially I like starting from scratch. I like the label to say, we're ready to work with you. This is our expectations on each side, what I'm expecting out of it, what mm-hmm. they're expecting out of it. And then I start composing like as if, I got hired to do a show mm-hmm. at a, at a like site specific work, basically. Yeah. And so then the music. Sometimes I have an idea already what I'm going to do, or I have a, have themes in mind that I would like to explore. And usually that's what I might propose to a label or to another artist if we're collaborating. So specifically, um, what ended up happening with the uh, Matthew David collab was 
uh, I've just been a fan of the label forever. Like uh, <laughs> from day one, I back in. I'm a huge fan of Dub Lab Radio out west. Hey, I'm actually you can't see it, but I'm wearing a Dub Lab shirt underneath my sweater. That's so. it. Future Roots. <laughs> Future That's Roots Radio. About. So like. I remember when he was helping with like the sprout sessions mm-hmm. at dub lab. And then I think maybe it was them that posted about him starting a label or maybe it was on alpha pup, mm-hmm. which is a d- digital distributor, huge, massive distributor out there. Wow. Um, and so I've just been a fan of the label forever. We've chatted in the past via email, but like I never would have thought I would be collaborating with him. And long story short, after the open space virtual show I did last year, then um, they started doing the uh, listen to music next to a, a plant at home <laughs> <laughs> instead of the um, ones in the park at Tierra de la Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. So they started doing these in, uh, virtual shows and casting a wider net as far as the artists, you know, that could perform. Mm-hmm. and somehow uh matthew reached out to me and was like hey would you be interested in doing one of these so yeah of course heck yeah so i played and uh it was a weird improv set and i was like panicking like man i just blew my one opportunity to impress these people (laughs) but uh people liked it yeah some people liked it um and afterward I had put out my own DIY tape um, last March, I think, last February or March. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like, I was just so, I was, I'm lazy. I don't really like shipping myself. So I did a small batch, and then I was like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> People can get the Bandcam version. Um, <laughs> but, like, Matthew and I think somebody behind the space or the shop in New York commend which I guess is an extension of Revenge International. Oh, yes. Yes, it is. So, like... So many sub-labels have gone on there. This is the kind of weird stuff, like, how could I have imagined that that would be happening about my work? Like, they're talking about my tape. Uh Like, somebody needs to put this out. Like, a label needs to put this out. Wow. I was like... That's crazy. Does somebody want to put this out? Sure. Like, (laughs) if you you want to fight over this, please tell me. So, you know, next thing you know... Matthew kind of DM'd me and we started talking and the basic idea was he offered me the opportunity, maybe I shouldn't be discussing this, but heck, why not? And he <laughs> offered me the opportunity to reissue that and he's like, would you be cool with that? And I was like, to be honest, no. <laughs> like, I don't want to, I want to make a new tape for, for you. Mm-hmm. So we started talking and next thing you know, we started exchanging files and that tape is basically the result of, of our exchanges. That's cool. So uh, this is actually a very recent thing then, right? You'd say this collaboration happened yeah. in 2020? Yeah, oh, 100%. Okay. 100%. So like the timeline from the inception of the project to its release was no more than five or six months. Mm. Yeah, so that, that kind of the turnaround was pretty quick. It's really so interesting. It by surprise. It's really interesting because... Uh, from the outside like i don't know like you kind of just like see an artist like what they put out on Bandcamp and like their social medias yep. and stuff but like i honestly thought that you were like homies with like leaving you know matthew david like leaving records type <laughs> stuff for a while because like i had looked at one of your records i think maybe 20 from 2013 or something where you were like yeah. thank you matthew david and a few other people like without your work i would not be you know my work would not be the yeah. same and so i was yeah, like yeah. oh maybe like matthew david offered you know him some insight on music or something and i was like oh wow the connection goes far back but that's actually really interesting so (laughs) so you know let me be you're not wrong but it is yeah (laughs) i shout people out like because i feel like i learn from so many artists whether it's getting inspiration from them or something i pulled from their music or an interview they did or Mm -hmm. a conversation we may have had via email So that, I think I just shouted him out because everything Leaving was doing was inspiring the scene globally. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Ambient and beats. But um, yeah, we weren't, and we had communicated before last year. It's just, it was never uh, 
a conversation about releasing music mm-hmm. or my music at least. We chatted. I remember even like when he was working on his uh, Out Mind, which was on Brain Feeder. Oh we wow! Had some conversations back then, and I was just super hyped for him because that was a big deal, even mm-hmm. for him. Like he's a huge luminary in the scene in L.A., but to release something on Brain Feeder is, is a great accomplishment, especially the type of music he was putting out. But all of that to say, um, even if you want to get an idea of timeline, mm-hmm. so yeah, it is crazy that I released so much music last year. Um, I kind of was tracking it, and I still had stuff I didn't finish. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but uh, that's not normal, but I'll tell you why it happened. Um. Well, first of all, I'll say for for before 2020, a lot of the music I was putting out would be like pieces, piecing things together that I had already been working on for a while. Mm-hmm. And um, basically, by the end of 2019, I had gone through all of my archives and like didn't have any more music to pull from, any more old music. So... I started really making stuff from scratch for the first time in a while. And yeah. um, I think I just, the way my mind works, I have a lot of ideas. I just usually didn't have time to make them. And mm-hmm. then there was this pandemic. And like also coinciding with that, I decided to set up a band camp subscription. Mm-hmm. And so there's no two ways around it knowing I had a handful of dedicated fans who would be interested if I had something. Yeah. Because I think a lot of times I would stop myself from releasing something just because I felt like I'm, I like this Does anyone else like it. So <laughs> essentially like knowing I had a like support and interest spurred me to create more than I've basically ever made in my life in that shortest span of time. That's cool. Uh, It's funny because I was actually literally just going to ask, is there any difference in your output pre-pandemic to now? But I guess it, you know, you literally just answered that in that you had a subscription service and you had more time. So that's why there was so much output in 2020. (laughs) (laughs) And and I guess also, too, it was a matter of inspiration because um, certain parts of the process I started to like I like all aspects of making an album, but Uh the part I hate the most is actually making the music, (laughs) oddly (laughs) enough. Um, So I I like would have, I usually think of song titles. Um, I'm thinking about the artwork. I'm thinking about where I may want to release it. Am I just going to release it digitally or do I feel like it deserves to be on a tape? And so I'm putting all those ideas in like the equivalent of a spreadsheet. Uh Uh-huh. And seeing how many projects, I like working on projects simultaneously too. So um, I guess before the pandemic, somewhere along those processes, I would either stall or get, talk myself out of continuing or morph it into something else. And uh, again, this links back to what you were asking about concentrics. Concentrics really was a kind of a turning point because I did four of those Uh between September and December of 2019. Oh, wow. So that kind of told me I could work quickly. Uh And I liked how it felt. And I was coming out with better and better stuff. And I just felt like, let me just keep improving. So That's awesome. So I guess jumping to uh, your most recent release, I think one of of your most recent releases, but... (laughs) I so, like, really apologize. Like I make it difficult to talk about. No, this. it's okay. Yeah, well, December. I was literally, I was literally texting Maddie, dude. I am having a hard time coming up with questions because there are so many Glia releases. I don't know what to talk about in specific. <laughs> well, you know, let me actually just say one thing on that. I really don't expect anyone to listen to all of it yet. Yeah, because I feel like you know you got to take time. And there's, again, a million other people releasing good music. Um, So never feel guilty, not even just you, but like anybody who hears this, never feel guilty if you want to chat with me about something but you're afraid, like, ooh, I haven't heard his latest album yet. Like, is he going to feel some (laughs) kind of way? I don't care. I really don't. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> That's funny. I love that. Um, but I guess the most recent record that I purchased uh, from, you know, your your uh, release with DASA, um, nice. what, what can you tell me about Totokia? Or I don't know how to pronounce okay. it, Totokia. So I don't either. This is one of the few times I hate this for this to come across as almost appropriation. But that actually, not all of my music necessarily has an interesting story. That has a pretty funny story. Um, <laughs> so, like a lot of people, I got caught up in the whole Mandalorian series. Yeah. Ah, uh, um, yes. <laughs> so, here's what I'm going to say about that. Um, basically, at some point in my nerdiness, I was looking at the gaffy sticks that the Tuscan Raiders use. Yeah. And uh, I don't even know how this happened, but somehow I, I found out that um, they weren't just a random design. Like, the production design for that weapon, that fictional weapon, um, was taken from Fijian culture. Oh, really? And so these tools, these other, like, warhammers... Um, called Totokia, that's literally, like, if you Google that, it looks like a gaffy stick. It looks like a short gaffy stick. And so then I just started thinking, oh, so then the other thing I found out is even those weapons were taken from another design, which uh -huh. is a fruit called Pandanus. Wow, a fruit. Really? <laughs> yeah. So it looks kind <laughs> of like a pineapple. Yeah. Kind of, but it's totally different. So... The more I thought about the connections between those three things, and I just like started formulating these compositions in three phases. And what it made me think about is, first of all, these these people took a totally harmless thing from nature and turned it into a weapon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, secondly, that one of the most famous and highest grossing, grossing film series in the world has stolen culture from a small poor island country and they're probably not seeing any of the profits from that and like how I know, yeah. an idea keeps getting corrupted in stages um so it, it, the whole album is kind of just like exploring first of all the first half um how an idea could become corrupted and then this, the b side of the tape or the whole gaffy stick side is kind of like we know so little about this fictional culture, the Tuscan Raiders, and yet, like, they're in every Star Wars film. So I kind of was, like, thinking about that and how useless sci-fi is and <laughs> <laughs> how um, maybe their music is interesting if they look interesting and they have interesting weapons. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was based on a lot of weird stuff. That reminds me, there's the Ursula K. Gwynn science fiction novel that comes with a cassette of the music of this, you know, like, fictional planet that she had, you know, created. Wasn't which that reissued? It was on Revenge, Revenge International. I was, like, I was like, when I first saw that, oh, man, that that's like a head trip, but it's amazing. It really, and I kind of love explorations like that, too. So. Speaking of Ursula K. Gwynn, uh, Earthsea had like a huge impact on me as a kid too. Like there's a lot of stories. We I was just talking with someone about the Phantom Soul booth, Earthsea. There's a bunch of books that kind of just expand your 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 thinking and imagination that still kind of have a weird impact on my music. That's awesome. That. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so thank you for asking about <laughs> that album because I don't think a lot of people have picked up on that. Someone else emailed me and was like is this about what i think it is and i was like yes it is <laughs> that's honestly cool they picked up on it that's awesome like that's crazy. yeah props to them for realizing that that was a, a weapon from where'd you say again fiji actually. yeah fiji <laughs> that's insane fiji. um yeah i i think i bought it specifically because i was like this is all the way from greece dude this is insane um you yeah. know that link up was just through uh, Finery, actually, because oh, I really? just put out a tape with them last summer, I want to say. Either he put out a tape or was part of a compilation. And um, yeah, so he reached out to me when he was starting this new label. I, I had this weird opportunity to be the first tape on a few labels, which 
why me? That, that's like, kind of cool. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's kind of <laughs> sick. Privilege. Like, yeah, I was gonna say, how how do you feel about that? How do you how does it feel to be the first release on a couple labels that someone's like it's, someone has a vision for what they want in their head and that's you? That it is kind of weird, and in a way, uh, you embrace it, the trust that's given you, and then it also kind of frees me up because I feel like I've made different music than I would have each of those times just because I knew 100% like these people are into what I'm doing. So. That's awesome. So um, I think we're going coming towards the end. Maddie, did you have anything in specific that you want to ask? Thomas, I think I always have something in specific <laughs> I want to ask. Uh, nice. But as you know, um, a rat is going to jump in your mouth. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Hold on. Wait, before we do that, we have the fan questions. We have the fan questions. Oh, my. We yeah. have no, let's, let's do the rat question. Okay, let's do it now. Let's do it now. Let's we'll go for it. Um, okay, so rat is going to jump in your mouth. We got no, I mean, there's no way to dodge it. And, you know, the rat can do whatever you want here, head or butt. <laughs> Which way is it going? <laughs> I almost wish I hadn't seen, I watched, um, I watched Matthew Sage's oh, and Grins, and I've seen a few other episodes. <laughs> so I knew this was coming, and it's still no easier to choose. I'm going to say but first, because <laughs> uh, I I feel like, I don't know, starting with the tail, maybe ease your way into it. Yeah. Easier. Is I, there a right way to eat a rat? <laughs> I mean... This is amazing. Yeah, I feel like I, <laughs> I feel like there'd be less of a struggle with the with the tail. You feel me? Yeah, and that's why maybe I'm switching up. Maybe start with the head so it'd be over even more quickly. Oh yeah, I'm so imagining like the rat is suffering, and I really wouldn't want to go through that. You're just gonna clamp down on that bad boy. <laughs> if a rat were to jump into my mouth and I it was going face first, I don't know if I'd get so like anxious or adrenaline kicking, and my teeth would just turn razor sharp and just head oh. bitten off. <laughs> oh, oh. See, that's a that's a mental image that will haunt me for the rest of my life. <laughs> oh, <geez>. Immense. <laughs> oh man. Oh my god, that's that so is funny. An amazing question. <laughs> it's so good, right? That's why we keep it here. <laughs> and I have to give Maddie props because I think Maddie he, is the first he one came to up ask with that. that with <laughs> yeah. I took that from some comedians on the What a Time podcast. So let's give a shout out to Patrick Monahan and Eli Unin. Hey. A few of those other New York types, but that they would ask that to any like comedian that came on and I thought this is great. Shout out, shout and out. I gave it to you when you started doing interviews, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, that was dope. I think the first person we asked was Glass Beach, right? I think that might not class speech. It goes back even further because you had well, you had Rat Fancy. In the oh, other true. Era. Yeah, I forgot that, about that. Then it actually made sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a little bit. on the nose. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was crazy. Are you down to take a couple a couple questions sure, from the sure. fans? You, you said there were some questions from fans. I would love to hear those. Okay, let's do it. Or from you all, anyone. So, um, this is from Emmanuel. Uh, I'm probably going to say this wrong, so sorry, Emmanuel. That's uh, fine. Um They're asking, he has a few songs with the name Stancerhorn in it. Uh, okay. Has he ever been to the mountain? Yeah, actually, uh, good pick up on that. So I pretty much, my song titles are places I've been or would like to go, uh, words I'm learning in other languages, foods, um, and that Mount Stancerhorn, for people who don't know, is a mountain in Switzerland. Got a chance to visit with my brothers and my family, uh, and time flies by now, like almost 12, 15 years ago. Oh, wow. It's like a beautiful mountain. You could take a funicular up the side of it and like oh, that's sick. there's restaurants and stuff up there. But it's just, it's a place that I had really positive memories and I kind of wanted to represent that in a song. That's cool. So we have another one from Romanenko, 1991. They're saying, what about Midi Sprout with a little sprout emoji? <laughs> um, I've been kind of interested in that because I first, I got to shout out two artists. Um, King Brit out of Philly and uh, Imka is a local Virginia artist, I think. Mm. Um, he's currently using it and has like even a pack of plant pack, sample pack, base sample pack on uh, Splice. But King Brit was the first artist I ever heard using it or interested in it. 
I kind of would love to. I just haven't actually tried it yet. It's a cool idea to take like the bio and what is it, biometric yeah. uh, from a plant and then like synthesize it. That's sick. It so, is. okay, this one, I guess, this one's from Matthew Sage in specific. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's like, when is the album going to be done? <laughs> you, you know what? It's really funny because he asked, you still cranking on that cashed album or what? <laughs> I knew it. I was just messing around. He really asked that? <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. I would, you know, I was actually hoping there's a couple albums and I will shout them out. Cash Media. Um, good question. Minaret. So the jazz label you were talking about earlier. Yeah, Minaret. I'm going to follow up on, on that uh-huh. label. And those are three that probably by my 2020 standards should have been done in December, (laughs) but my son was born in, in September. So things have slowed down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, I'm super excited. It's a duo album on cash. So, um, maybe also if it was a solo album, and this is no criticism because I love the idea. I probably would have just like done whatever came to my head, Uh but I'm trying to think differently while working with another artist. And, uh, I hope the results are something that excite everyone. It's going to be fun. That's awesome. Can you uh, say who who is the duo with, or is that a secret? Yes. No, it's not a secret. Hopefully, he doesn't mind. Andrew Andrew Shike. Oh, tight. Uh, but yeah, Chicago is the one who's uh, working with me on this. So hell yeah, and he actually is dropping a tape with Leaving as well. So like, oh, again, wow. there's this intertwining of Matthews, like Cash Media people. Like if you heard the band Music for Dogs, yeah. Um, Oh, those guys! And yeah, like we're all connected in different ways. Is we're and, in the same thing. Is Andrew Scheich? Wait, were you saying Andrew Scheich was in Music for Dogs or no? You're just no. He's oh, okay. like I think they were all friends. Like I first heard about them from them, I believe, performing at Open Space. At one okay, point. and then they also their first album was initially released on uh, Minaret. Yeah. Oh wow. So linked with yeah. So it's just like weird coincidences it seriously is yeah it seriously is actually Bryn was the one who told um us about your music um when we interviewed Bryn so yeah he's like he, that was Bryn is one of the people that changed my 2020 for sure like just listening to his music more yeah conversations with him mm-hmm. and like the exposure that he's given me to in some situations is super awesome I love that dude and I'm going to say there might be something by the end of 2020, 2021 that involves both of us, but I'm not going to talk about that. Wow, now. that's crazy. Well, for now, we're looking forward to uh, your new record on Cashed with Andrew Scheich. And then also, shout out Bryn's record with uh, Jimmy Tamborello yes. and Maurice. Ooh, that's going to be insane. I just realized um, <clears throat> Jimmy Tamborello is going to be on the show next month. And it's funny because mm-hmm. me and Maddie are going to be inter. We've interviewed the whole trio at that point. So once we interview, uh, um, got, Jimmy Tamborello, <laughs> it was really exciting to tell my mom, "Hey, we're interviewing Jimmy from the Postal Service." Exactly. <laughs> That's like the only person we're into that our families might know. I know. It's so <laughs> wild. I I have to actually shout out Jimmy too because um I just did a guest mix on his show Dying. Song. I think I saw that. Yeah. And. I have to say, a hundred percent, Jimmy is one of the people like Dan that, like, if it wasn't for them, I might not still be making music, and they might not realize the impact that they had. But Jimmy is the first person that's like that I maybe kind of admired that really backed my music, like when I was nowhere. Mm-hmm. Like he's been playing some of my music on the show since probably like twenty eleven or twenty. Oh, that's insane! Wow. I didn't realize Jimmy Tamborello has had a show on Dub Lab for that long. Yeah, and like he really plays independent music. Like he yeah. plays music and he looks for music all around the world, which mm-hmm. I super respect. So yeah, he um in the past couple of years he's been a huge uh support and like just always inspired mutual inspiration from uh-huh. the stuff that we do and uh I'm super hyped to get to do a guest mix for his show. That's awesome. Yeah, uh Jimmy is sick and it's really interesting. Um he's doing a guest mix on my show. So it's interesting because it's the other way around, dude. Cause it's like, 
<laughs> he usually has all these sick artists doing guest mix yeah. on his show, and now it's like, all right, Jimmy, your turn, right? <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, you know, I, we kind of take it for granted, but I feel like uh, Matthew was talking about that last year. Like, there was a stretch where like people don't really reach out to him because they feel like he has his own label, but he would love to do stuff like work on projects, work on albums, do yeah. releases even elsewhere sometimes. But yeah. It's like, oh, he, he can handle it. That's kind of how people probably think of Jimmy too. Yeah, I feel like that's probably a thing. Um, You know, I feel like you probably get pigeonholed in that way where it's like, ah, oh, this person's already always doing like, you know, their own interviews or their own thing. Like, why should I hit? They probably don't want to do something for themselves, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So anyways, uh, yeah, Jimmy Tamburello, that's a little sneak peek into uh, what's to come for TBD. That's awesome. Yeah, going to be announcing uh, April's full schedule very soon. So um, I think that just about does it. Did you have any remarks you want to put in the airwaves and archives? Like where can people keep up with your projects? Yeah, I would say um, fizu.bandcamp.com. That's I-F-I-Z-U or Z-U for our international viewers. Uh, <laughs> that's where you can find almost all of my music and yeah that's pretty much it if, if you you can reach out or like message me through Bandcamp that's probably easiest or if you know where to find me on Twitter then I'd always welcome that my email is probably floating somewhere so yeah uh, yeah I, I, there's too many people to thank um, or to shout out Matthew Matthew David for one Rin Colin uh Dan Dirks, Andrew, uh, and I will definitely forget some people that I haven't mentioned, but I have to say Umitake Tamura from Japan. Oh, okay. tight. Um, and uh, Chad Valencia, another great artist. Shout out. Those are, those are some people that I kind of bounce ideas off and work with, and we haven't actually shared any official releases, so... We'll see if anything comes to fruition with them. That's awesome. I uh, just want to let them know. I appreciate <laughs> everybody's support. Anyone who's ever listened to my music, whether you bought it or not, uh, it really definitely means a lot. And use those sample packs. If you're listening yeah. to this, uh, <laughs> use those sample packs in your own music. We got uh, Maddie's going to hop on that. So I will, it. though. I'm going to I'm gonna get some Half-Life 2 sounds as well. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. It in. You got to get the Dreamcast version for sure. <laughs> Oh, that's right. The Dreamcast version of Half Life. Yeah. Let me go get a DVD porter here. Let's get on it. I almost want to get a Dreamcast again. This is a tangent. I almost want to get a Dreamcast again. I still have a GameCube, but somehow I lost my Dreamcast. So I found a modded original Xbox for fifty bucks about four years ago, Dude, and they're so cheap now. Stuff like that, and I still see at Swap Meets Dreamcast for about sixty to seventy-five. Do you really? The games are hard to find, but the console yeah. isn't. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, thank you again also for uh, having me on. It was really cool. Great questions. So yeah. Thank you. Thanks for performing. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's all we have for today. So uh, thanks for tuning in to TBD on KCSB FM 91.9 every Sunday, 4 to 6 p.m. And NetNet Radio every Saturday, 8 p.m. This is Jonathan with his project, Glia. Thanks for being on the show, Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks for having me.